Hello, and welcome to this video on a thermodynamic explanation for the origins of life. The Origins of Species was a quintessential book by Charles Darwin, but it only explains the evolution and selection of species. It does not explain how life came to be. This is where a creative application of physics comes into play. The author of this theory is Jeremy England, biophysicist of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He presents this as an expansion and supportive argument for the process of evolution. To quote them, On the contrary, I am just saying that from the perspective of the physics, you might call Darwinian evolution a special case of a more general phenomenon. The underlying theory is based on the laws of thermodynamics, the zeroth law being that if two systems are in equilibrium with a third, then they are in equilibrium with each other. The first law being that energy is conserved, and that it cannot be destroyed, only changed. The second is that the sum of the entropies of the universe increase over time. And the third law being that once a system approaches a constant state, that this constant state is typically close to zero energy. From the view of physics, there is only one essential difference between living things and inanimate clumps of carbon. The former tends to be much better at capturing energy from the environment and dissipating it as heat. The formula is based on the established physics and indicates that when a group of atoms is surrounded by a heat bath, like the ocean or atmosphere, it will gradually restructure itself to dissipate energy more efficiently. This could mean that under certain conditions, matter will acquire the key physical attributes associated with life. At the heart of England's idea is the second law of thermodynamics, which is essentially translates as entropy will increase over time, and that hot things cool down, gas diffuses, and that eggs will scramble but never spontaneously unscramble. And in short, energy will spread out and therefore entropy will both decrease but increase in an attempt to decrease the amount of energy available. Although entropy must increase over time, in an isolated system it can keep its entropy low. That is, divide energy unevenly among the contents of the closed environment by greatly increasing the entropy of whatever surrounds it. This was epitomized by the physicist Schrodinger, and they argued that it is what living things must do in order to survive. Using a formula by Jasinski and Crook, England derived a generalization of the second law of thermodynamics, and this holds that a system of particles within a certain environment or with certain characteristics, subject to an external energy source, such as the sun, will dump their heat into the surrounding environment. This class of systems includes all living things. England then determined how such systems tend to evolve over time as they increase their irreversibility. To quote, We can show very simply from the formula that the more likely evolutionary outcomes are going to be the ones that absorb and dissipate more energy from the environment's external drive on the way to getting there. Self-replication, or reproduction in biological terms, is the process that drives the evolution of life on Earth and is one such mechanism by which a system might dissipate an increasing amount of energy over time. Michael Brenner, a professor of applied mathematics and physics in Harvard, and his collaborators present theoretical models and stimulations of microstructures that self-replicate. Abiogenesis is when something non-biological turns into something biological. England has put forward the belief that Thermodynamics might explain what drives lifelike behavior in otherwise lifeless chemicals. To quote, Essentially the system tries a bunch of things on a small scale, and one of them starts experiencing positive feedback. It does not take that long for it to take over the character of organization in the system. This has been seen in places like the Galapagos Islands, where Darwin saw finch species that had each developed their own particular niche, or their own organization in the system, and that this organization system for each particular subspecies had taken over and allowed them to proliferate. Abiogenesis is like this, and that it is the origin of life, and to quote the primordial soup. Life on Earth first bloomed about 3.7 million years ago, when chemical compounds in this primordial soup somehow sparked into life, and scientists have been suspect of whatever caused that spark of life ever since. The molecules swimming in Earth's early primordial soup would have been continually destroyed by ultraviolet radiation from the sun, 
as well as heat and other processes. But when certain special pairs of molecules combine, they form a larger compound, and they sometimes come out with protections that neither compound had individually. An example of this is glutamic acid, which is two glycine molecules. Another which has been previously mentioned in other videos is, is the maltose, which is two glucose molecules together. Individually, each of these molecules is easily destroyed by ultraviolet radiation, but together, they are stable. There's a famous parable called the watchmaker's problem, and this was described by prize-winning economist Herbert Simon. There are two watchmakers trying to assemble a watch of a thousand pieces. The first assembles their watch one piece at a time, and they must assemble it in one sitting, or else it falls apart and they have to start over. The second watchmaker builds theirs first bit by bit, creating modules and assembling those modules. Each module is stable and can be put aside and returned to later on without having to restart. In order to build up into the ever larger configuration of a watch, they must either do it all in one sitting as with the first watchmaker, or as with the second watchmaker, as they complete each module it can be put aside and later on assembled, which is a far more efficient and easy approach, as the small modules do not break down, and they can resume from where they started. The second being so much more efficient means that life as a parable to this does not need to be built in an entirety from the ground up, but instead by finding one small molecule that will survive the heat and radiation will allow life to build up from that simple, small, biological compound. England's theoretical results are generally considered valid. It is his interpretation that his formula represents the driving force behind a class of phenomena in nature that includes life that remains unproven. This is an exceptional example of thinking outside the box. But there are labs that are now looking to test this theory and to demonstrate whether or not it is true. You will find the link to their lab in the description box below. But the interesting thing here is that the theory presented has implications for life beyond Earth, albeit only a modest increase in the probability. But considering the number of planets, the number of possible biological chemical structures, and the number of possible sources of energy that would then need to be dealt with by these compounds, it increases the probability Thank you for watching this video. Please post any comments, questions or suggestions below.